All right, section 3.2, logarithmic functions. Uh, this is the last section before the um, first exam. <clears throat> so the objectives are going to be a review of converting between exponential and log equations, a review of solving some exponential equations, a review of solving problems involving exponential and log functions, and differentiating functions involving natural logs. So the vocabulary is just logs and natural logs here. Okay, so recall that logarithms, logarithms are written in the form log of x base a equals y. That's the case if and only if you can rewrite it as a to the y equals x. And the reason for that is because logs are just nothing more than exponents written in a slightly different way. <clears throat> the easiest way to convert between logs and exponentials is to understand that the base of the log is the same as the base of the exponential. So here's the base of the log. Here's the base of the exponential. Let me erase that because it kind of looks like I wrote all over the A. But here's the base of the exponential. The exponent of the log is over here. That's the exponent right there. Y. And as you can see, the exponent of the um, exponential is y. And then that equals what I call the argument of the log, which is the x over here. So the easiest pattern, if you look at the log, is kind of that um, uh, little circle pattern there. If you take the base of the log and you raise it to the answer over here, you're going to get the argument. And that will create um, an exponential. Going backwards from exponentials, you just have to know which pieces are the base and which piece is the exponential, which piece is the argument, and so on. It's not terribly difficult. Again, that should be review. Okay, a couple of special logs. Log base 10, right here, is just written as log x. So if you don't see a base written, like in this one right here, it's assumed to be a base 10. Log base e of x is what's called the natural log, and it's written as ln of x. And again, they don't typically write the e down there, although you can if you need to. You can write ln and then a base of an e in between there, and then x. So these are the two special ones, log x and ln of x. If you see any other log, it has to have a base written. Some of the properties, the sum property, or the, excuse me, the sum product property. Um, I could go into a huge explanation as to why all this is, at this point, it's probably in your best interest just to kind of know these. Um, if you take the log of some base and you have two things being multiplied together, you are allowed to split the log into two separate logs. So you have the log base A of the first one plus the log base A of the second one. So just know that sum and product um, go together. Difference and quotient are also going to go together. So if you were to take the log base A of M divided by N, right there, you can rewrite that as two logs, which is log of M minus the log of N. So again, know that the difference and the quotient go together. And then the power property, this one's quite useful, says that if you take the log of M raised to some power, P, you can actually pull that power out to the front, which we did here, and then you can have P times the log of M. The inverse property is actually really cool. There's two of them because it goes both ways. The easiest thing to look for, and you got to be careful so that you don't mess this one up in some in some way because um, people get confused about this, but <clears throat> the log base here is A. The base of the exponential, which is in the argument, is also A. If you have that, if you take the log of an exponential where the base and the log base are the same, the answer is just the exponent, X. <clears throat> works in the other way too. It works if you have if you start off with an exponential. So the base of the exponential here is a, but the in the um, exponent of the exponential it's a log, and its base is also a. Once again, the answer is going to be the argument of that log, which is just x. So basically, if the two bases are the same and you're compositing them together, which is what we're doing in both of the inverse properties, you're just going to get the argument. <clears throat> and then the change of base formula just says that if I have something where I need to change the bases into a common base of some kind, um, I can take the log of M with a base A 
and rewrite that as the log of m divided by the log of a. Notice there's no base written in those, so it's assumed to be base 10. But it could technically be any base. It could be base 7. It could be base 12. It doesn't make any difference. It's going to give the same value. And because of that, we can write, all, write them also as natural logs, which is just a base of e. So log of, uh, excuse me, natural log of m divided by natural log of a. Both of those work. The way I always remember it is because this one is the base, it's the one that goes on the bottom, and then this one goes on the top. That's just the easy way for me to remember it. Okay, some graphical properties. The log of x base a, as long as a is greater than 1. And by the way, <clears throat> a must be a number um, greater than 0. You cannot take a log. Um, I'm sorry, I apologize. You cannot take the log of something which is less than or equal to 0. So this x right here, part of your domain, has to be greater than 0, which we will see right here. The domain, x must be greater than um, 0. cannot be equal to 0, and um, it cannot be less than 0. <clears throat> the x-intercept here is 1, 0, as you can see right there. Passes through the point A, 1. <clears throat> which, so if you plug in 1 for x, if you take the log of 1, um, that's always going to be 0. So the bait, if you have a base of A, it's going to be um, 0. <clears throat> so there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 and no y-intercept. So instead of having a horizontal asymptote like exponentials did, this one here has a vertical asymptote right there. <clears throat> and there's no y-intercept. This thing will not cross the y-axis. It will get insanely close to the y-axis, but it won't cross. The range of this is all real numbers. So it goes from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. You might look at the graph and think, wow, this thing does not look like it's going off to positive infinity. It is still going to keep going up. It's just going to go up very slowly. <clears throat> all right, and this graph technically is a reflection of e to the x. It's actually reflected over the line y equals x, which is this line right here. It's a reflection over that line. So if you were to draw e to the x, which I'll try and sketch in here for you real quick, it's going to look something like this. And as you can see, if you folded that over that orange line, they would lie right on top of each other. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and erase the e to the x real quick here, but that was the general idea. And I'm going to erase the line y equals x. That was its reflection line. All right, and you can obviously go to your textbook and do more review if you don't feel as comfortable with the properties. Let's go ahead now and look at how we find the derivative of specifically a natural log. We're not going to worry about taking a derivative of a regular log. It just isn't um, that important for this particular unit. So we're going to skip that. It's not terribly difficult, but it does involve um, using the um, change of base formula. <clears throat> we're really not going to worry about it. Okay, in the case of a natural log, if y equals the natural log of x, that's our function, we can re rewrite y as f of x, which we did here. And then what we can do is we can change the log into an exponential. So again, remember I said we don't usually write it, but you could write the e as the base here. And if you want to change this to an exponential, you would take e, raise it to the f of x, and you would get x. Well, that's exactly what we have in line 2 here, e to the f of x equals x. <clears throat> and then if we wanted to actually find the derivative, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides, just algebraically. What you do to one side, you have to do the same thing to the other side to keep the balance. So we're going to take the derivative here in the next step of both sides of the equation. Well, the derivative of e to the x, if you remember from our last section, is rewrite the function e to the x times the derivative of the exponent. Technically, it's times the natural log of the base, but the base here is e, so the natural log of e is 1. We don't have to write that part. And then on the right side here, if I take the derivative of x, which comes from here, take the derivative of x, that's just 1. <clears throat> so to solve for f prime, because that's our derivative, we simply divide both sides by e to the f of x. So f of x equals 1 divided by e to the f of x. But if we go all the way back to the beginning here, f of x was just the natural log of x. So then we would get 1 over e to the natural log of x. 
but e to the natural log of x, because the natural log's base is e, that is that inverse property, inverse property, I think it was 2 on the previous page, that just gives us x. And if all of that doesn't make any sense, and that's fine if it's, if it's a little fuzzy to you, maybe give it some time to sink in, but I'm going to give you a little bit easier way to think about this. The easiest thing is the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. I'm going to take that just a little bit further. The derivative, so let's say here that f of x is the natural log of, and we'll call this g of x for now, so it's something different. If I want to take the derivative, f prime of x, well, it follows that what it's going to be is it's 1 over the argument. In this case, the argument is g of x, so it's 1 over g of x. And then applying the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of the argument, which is g prime of x. That should only be a single prime. It looks like a double. g prime of x. There we go. So in, in, in essence, the derivative of a natural log is 1 over its argument, times the derivative of the argument. That's the chain rule for natural log, and that's all you have to know. Now, sometimes we can use properties to make this easier, so let's go ahead and take some derivatives here. In the first example, a, dy dx, is going to be the derivative of 3 natural log of x. 3 is a constant out front, so it just stays 3. And the derivative of natural log of x we defined as 1 over x, 1 over the argument. Technically, it's times the derivative of the argument. The derivative of x is 1, so we don't have to write that. So really, the easiest way to write that one would just be 3 over x, multiplying those together. Okay, in part b, we're going to have to apply a, uh, looks like a product rule in there. So dy dx in part b. So the first part here is a product. It's x squared times the natural log of x. So the derivative of x squared is 2x times the second one, which is the natural log of x, product rule, plus the derivative of natural log of x, which is 1 over x, times the first one, which is x squared. And then I've got, that finishes the product rule, but then I can't forget that I still have this 5x out there I have to take the derivative of, but that's just 5. All right, so we can actually clean this one up, and let's go ahead and do this in this case. So 2x ln of x, not much you can do there. That's just 2x times the natural log of x. But 1 over x times x squared can be simplified because the x squared technically gets multiplied on the top, which would give you x squared over x, which is just x. And then plus 5. Okay, and in part c, we're going to have to apply... Um, well, we don't have to, but we're going to apply, in this case, um, one of the properties of logs, which say I can split that top. So let's rewrite this. Y equals the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of the absolute value of X. Now, I could split that because I have two things being multiplied together inside the natural log, so I can split it by addition. Notice I don't need the absolute value around the 2 because 2 is already positive, so I don't need to worry about that. And then over x cubed. Now when we go to do the derivative of this, it's going to um, take the chain, uh, excuse me, the quotient rule. So dy dx, the derivative of the top, well, the derivative of natural log of 2, be careful on that, natural log of 2 is just a number. There's no variable there. So that's derivative of 0 plus the derivative of natural log, and yes, it says natural log absolute value of x, it's just going to be 1 over x, so the derivative of the top of this thing is just 1 over x, times the bottom, x cubed, minus the derivative of the bottom, which is 3x squared, times the entire top, which is going to be natural log of 2, plus natural log absolute value of x, all over the denominator squared. x cubed squared is x to the sixth. Okay. <clears throat> In example two, part a and b, we actually do require the chain rule. Oh, and technically we could have used the chain rule in example c right above 
but I wanted to show the way it was meant to be done in this case. Chain rule actually probably would have been easier to use in the one above, but that's okay. All right. In the first one, dy dx. Remember, it is 1 over the argument when you're taking the derivative of a natural log. 1 over the argument. So it's 1 over x squared minus 5 times the derivative of the argument. The derivative of x squared minus 5 is 2x. Done. Okay, one more. Uh, this one's just going to be f prime of x because they started us with f of x. Again, it's 1 over the argument. Yes, you can write 1 over x cubed plus 4 over x, but if you put 1 over a fraction, it really just reciprocates the fraction or flips the fraction over. It's probably an easier way to understand it. So it's going to be 1 over this fraction inside there or just flip the fraction. So it's x over x cubed plus 4. And then I have to multiply that by the derivative of the inside of there. That right there is going to be a quotient rule. So we have to do the quotient. So the derivative of the top is 3x squared times the bottom, which is x, minus the derivative of the bottom, which is 1, times the top, x cubed plus 4, all over the bottom squared. And there's a lot of cleaning up that we could actually do on this one, but if you get to that point right there, I'm pretty happy with that eventually we will have to be able to clean something like this up in order to be able to do further um, further application. Speaking of application, here we go. Example three. In a psychological experiment, students were shown a set of nonsense syllables such as pock, riz, dec, and so on, and asked to re recall them every minute um, thereafter. So <clears throat> the percentage, R of T, who retained the syllables after T minutes was found to be given by the logarithmic function, um, R of T equals 80 minus 27 natural log of T for T is greater than or equal to 1. What percentage of students retained the syllables after 1 minute and then find R prime of 2 and explain what that represents? First one's pretty easy. We just need to plug in one because it says what percentage of students retain the syllables after one minute. We are simply looking for R of one. Well, that's going to be 80 minus 27 natural log of one. The natural log of one is zero. 27 times zero is zero. So really what we get out of this is 80. And if 80 is a percentage, then that's 80%. And then r prime, that means we have to actually find r prime of t first. Well, let's see. r prime of t, the derivative of 80 is 0. The derivative of negative 27, natural log of t, the negative 27 is a constant out in the front. It just stays there. No variable attached to it. The derivative of natural log of t is going to be 1 over t. Technically times the derivative of t, but that would be 1 in this case since t is our independent variable. t is like our x. And then it says we need to find r prime of 2. So r prime of 2 is going to be negative 27 times 1 over 2, which is negative 27 halves. And what does that mean in... Um, <clears throat> In specifics to this model, well, r prime is a rate of change. So let's go back to the original to see what is actually changing and how it's changing. We've got something which is changing over time. It looks like we're dealing with minutes here. And it's the number of syllables, well, actually, it's the percentage who retain the syllables after t minutes. So this is, um, I guess you would say, the percent of students. So we can say percent over time, or over minutes, actually, because the time is in minutes. So let's not just say time here. Let's actually say minutes. So it's the percentage of students who retain per minute. So basically what's happening here is at the two-minute mark, so at two minutes, So 
percent of students retaining the syllables syllables I think I spelled that right is it's a negative so it's decreasing decreasing by 27 halves or 27 halves would be 13.5 so 13 0.5 percent per minute and that's what that means so as you would expect the longer period of time that goes by the harder it is to retain the syllable so if the um at two minutes the amount of people retaining it is going to be going down if, at five minutes you would expect that to go down even further and so on all right, so there you go. That is the logarithmic section. You guys should have plenty enough to do, um, do what you need, and good luck.